With the newly created Global Defense Alliance, the military higher-ups expected that troops from all different countries would arrive at the shores of Northern Africa in the coming weeks and months. The Spanish soldiers deployed around Casablanca made sure to hold the shorelines towards Algeria that gave access to multiple harbors for incoming reinforcements. The majority of the zombie horde had focused on the east and south. Millions of the undead stomped over the Sudanese ground, killing humans left and right. Reinforcing would prove to be a problem at the front, as soldiers needed preparation and training, whereas zombies needed to land one successful bite to have their numbers increase. Over 220,000 zombies had already been put down, but it seemed like the horde was ever endless. Countries like Tunisia and Algeria were amongst the ones with the highest death count of countries currently still active in the war. With the form of the GDA, all countries from Asia would be involved in the battle as well. Many were not combat ready and would need several months to prepare the migration of their troops. But the 2002 FIFA World Cup brought a boost in morale and support from Asia on a global scale. The tourists were welcomed as comrades and Japan and Korea were seen as valuable allies as well as gracious hosts. Back during the bidding, South Korea and Japan made a common two-country bid and won. More than usual, the common people clustered to their TV screens as the world's camaraderie felt stronger than ever. After Japan got eliminated in the round of 16, only South Korea was left to represent the hosts and made it all the way to the semi-finals after eliminating both Italy and Spain to meet their match in Germany. Germany would then go on to be defeated 0-2 by Brazil, and Brazil thus won its fifth World Cup title. At the same time, more countries were entering the waters near North Africa. One of Russia's fleets lay wait in front of the shores until given the order to disembark the troops. Mubarak, in all of his confidence, proved to having underestimated the zombies as his forces were being pushed back rapidly in Libya. The same situation in Asia also counted for South America. Many countries were not combat ready and needed time to prepare their war machine. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos promised Colombia would build an army that would make the GDA proud. Time was indeed of the essence, but he expected to have a fighting force ready in the beginning of 2003. Brazil was seen as the battering ram of South America, as its eastern shores lay closest to the African continent. Brazil would be used to deploy the armies of the other South American countries, and President Fernando Cardoso said he welcomed his neighboring countries to travel via Brazil, though he did warn them that their infrastructure was not meant to support that many army convoys at once. For Holland, Balkan and his move to start using artillery pieces in their trained divisions continued on bearing fruit as new countries agreed to land lease to provide the country with necessary equipment. The convoys required for this were not even scratching the surface of the trade capabilities of the Rotterdam Harbor. Because this had worked so well, and with the addition of many new countries to the GDA, Balkan had issued the order of light tanks being built for the divisions as well. The Dutch Prime Minister was confident that a similar scenario with the artillery pieces would repeat itself with the light armor. The announcement of the GDA also fueled citizens to sign up for the military, thereby increasing Holland's manpower by almost a tenfold on a voluntary basis alone. Because of this, many divisions could be trained at once as more higher ranking military personnel were hired as well. And so, as predicted, the first of the light armor were offered to the small European country. In North Africa, the Russian fleet had begun deploying its men, of which some had already reached the front. A few were sent out eastward to strengthen the roads towards the Algerian harbors. The Russian troops stationed in Libya did not fare so well, as they were pushed back towards the shore more with each passing day. The weeks of fighting in Africa resulted in a worrying report at the end of June. According to data collected by satellite imagery and footage by AC-130s, the zombie horde was estimated at somewhere between 10 and 11 million strong. It was the same equivalent of around a thousand divisions. The data was disheartening, but mankind would not throw in the towel merely based on data. Though most western eyes were focused on the northwest and east, the south should not be forgotten about as the zombies made their way down as well. Not at an alarming rate as in Sudan, but still to a worrying degree. The GDA requested South Africa not to send troops up north, but prepare defensive positions to act as a buffer. They might be the final resistance, and all that would keep the zombie horde in the south 
from moving towards the northeast to strengthen the main horde even more. The worst case scenario was that the virus would spread within South Africa itself, and President Thabo Mbeki said he would install stricter rules to keep the virus outside their borders. In Europe, most countries were in the stage of war preparation. Poland was building steel factories to keep up with the demand in steel for the increased need. Norway invested in oil, invaluable to many countries and a golden opportunity for Norway itself as the country was not able to ship units towards Africa as easy as the countries in Central Europe. In Asia, most people's gaze were pointed at China, which had a new president. President Hu Jintao promised to be more active in the war than his predecessor, and used China's strength in number and size to aid the war front. Infrastructure in the country was a major issue, and Jintao requested help from Russia, North and South Korea, and Japan to aid them in developing a decent infrastructure to support the migration of troops. In July, word had gotten out that more of the zombie virus had spread in Spanish-held territory on the North African side. This was problematic, as soldiers from other countries arriving at the area had a chance of being exposed as well. Soon after, a zombie uprising from within Algeria itself crumbled the central front formerly held between Morocco and Libya. Luckily, there were enough soldiers stationed to quickly retake the ground and set up a new front, but it was not as sturdy as it was before. Troops from India and Japan immediately made sure that the connection between the harbors was still intact. The few zombies that were caught in between the troops and the shore should not be too big of a threat, and the soldiers were confident in eliminating them over the coming days. A possible disaster with the loss of Algeria was luckily avoided. Though currently not having clear intel on the western shore of Africa, some of the military higher-ups suggested an invasion force to at least hold some new ground and attack from a different direction. This could speed up the deployment of troops and also split up the zombie horde and weakening them in numbers. The military got word that Cameroon had been lost, and in Libya, the troops were all but pushed back to their limit. President Jacques Chirac announced that a large number of French reinforcements were on their way, but the real question was if they would make it in time. From two different sides, the zombies attacked in large numbers, and an Indian division had been separated and left to die if not secured quickly. Egypt did not fare any better. Mubarak's once confident attitude had made way for fear and unbelief. Though it might have been true that he had stationed the most troops at his borders compared to the other countries, the undead horde simply was too massive on his side. There was no doubt that Egypt would fall in the next coming months. Israel seemed prepared to catch the blow as the whole country was covered in defensive bunkers, positions and walls. Though Israel did not possess the number to deal with the horde, the narrow space of their landmass could work as a choke point, neutralizing the overwhelming number advantage that the zombies possessed. But Sudan endured the worst of all. It was here where the heart of the horde lay, and even with the little foreign help Sudan received, the undead menace covered itself over Sudanese lands like a divine plague. Satellite imagery showed the frantic circling of several countries close to the African shores and a clear distinction in malice between the eastern and northwestern front. It also once again reinstated the possibility of an invasion on the western shore. Since the zombies' main force in power stood in the increase in number by wounding human soldiers, President George W. Bush set up a focus on the research of heavier tanks. The tanks themselves would not only serve as an attacking unit, but could provide protection to the crew inside. It was essential that the tanks would not be separated from their main squad though, as a separated tank covered in undead could quickly end up becoming a tomb for the crew who were awaiting a slow death. Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi's earlier efforts to befriend the US had paid off, as they received the necessary funds to build two dockyards and three naval bases. These bases would also be used by other countries in preparation to be shipped over to Africa and the south. In Holland, a meeting was held on increasing the time and efficiency of training its troops. Army drill specialist Matthijs Jacometti was chosen to come up with a plan to decrease the required time by 5%. Rumor had it that Holland might be the country requested to initiate the invasion in the west of Africa, not as an attacking force, but to rapidly take over land not overpopulated with undead as quickly as possible and recapture as many ports and airfields as it could before serving as a defensive unit that could quickly be reinforced by stronger countries. If this were true, an evasion like that likely would not happen until the following year. 
Balkanen also issued the build of new synthetic oil factories on Dutch soil to cope with the increase in demand. This time, the factories would not be built on Curaçao, as time was of the essence. In the northwest, the combined strength of troops from many nations succeeded in reclaiming more territory and almost securing the entire northern coastline. As some of the military higher-ups felt they had enough men stationed to make a push, preparations for an operation to fight southward were being made. Where in the north they celebrated on reclaimed land, in the south it was nothing but fear and tears as Congo was the next country to fall to the jaws of the undead. The same dread befell in Sudan, as it was still not able to at least halt the zombies, even with the backup from several different countries. In Libya, the desperate situation had turned as much of the land to the west was recaptured and the separated Indian division was liberated by a valiant effort of the Japanese. The French reinforcements sent in by Chirac had arrived as well and were impressive in number and morale. They brought food and smokes for the tired and exhausted soldiers who witnessed hell over the past few weeks. They were relieved that help of a considerable size had arrived. At the end of August of 2002, Sudan was almost completely eliminated. The first of the zombies had reached Ethiopia. They hoped on help from the Chinese due to their weapons manufacturing deal made a few months back. The number of units at the Ethiopian border were impressive and consisted of units from many different countries, including the soon-to-be-eliminated Sudan. The Sudanese men mourned their fallen country, but they were battle-hardened in pushing the undead demons back to the hell that they came from. And then, on the 2nd of September 2002, the Operation Alpha Crucis was underway. A massive push south, along an insanely large front spanning from west to east, mowed its way through thousands of zombies. Soldiers from Spain, Germany, China, India, America, Russia, Japan, and France were involved. Many were from different backgrounds, from different religions, but together they stood as one and were able to strengthen their grip on the northern part of Africa. This was the first time in a long while that good news had finally arrived.